do you think culturally as a whole we've lost this value of self-discipline which of course has to be has to be learned and in a way has to be partially imposed not not in a abusive way but needs to be imposed otherwise we would never do it so do you think we've lost that culturally now discipline yes i i think i think we probably have and and i think this is an aspect of of degeneration within the culture and um, but because the 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 culture implies cultivated people and to cultivate yourself whether it's in any um any of the senses or at any level they requires this this disciplined um process and and so i and i i also think another element of our culture which undermines this um is the constant distractions that we are um subjected to and and uh, trying to capture our um attention span you know for commercial purposes uh, we live in what's now called the attention economy mm -hmm. and, and so the the if if you can persuade advertisers that um you can capture the attention for long enough for them to put an advert in front of you and then you'll get paid for doing that and i think all of that um dissipates the mind uh distracts us and really um disperses our substance if you like our substance of being is dispersed um and it really needs to be it's all it's fine you know to, to do a certain amount of this as well but it needs to be brought back to um this inwardness and one pointedness and concentration which is the opposite of what we're talking about and so i think if you know when concentration goes and um, then there, there there's a certain concentration sorry a certain discipline and concentration and that this dissipation and distraction is the opposite of that and so i think in that sense attention uh, some people have said this including simon vey yes but um, is our most important form of currency mm. and we've only got a certain amount of real quality attention per day mm. you know due to you know our physical limitations and so we need to be very judicious um about where we put this attention set your mind on god's kingdom before everything else indeed and everything else will come to you as well and the other side of that is perhaps if if we have lost this quality of uh, attention as as a as a habit and as a as a discipline then uh, there are there's a price to pay and uh, there are uh, degeneration takes place both at the level of the person of the individual person the psyche but also collectively i mean do do you think that wrong ideas say wrong but or let's say shallow ideas about consciousness and the source of consciousness have contributed in other words this the, the loss of this more subtle area of self understanding in the human uh that this has contrib contributed to the both the ecological and the sociological earthquakes that that we are feeling the tremors of more and more these days in other words that's what's behind this crisis we're in yeah yes i do um and for me um these are the two aspects of the materialistic world view and um, so that the in the 17th century we got the, the rise of science and the rise of a a view that matter gives rise to mind or matter gives rise to consciousness brain gives rise to consciousness and that humans were essentially machines and this was expressed by Julien de la Mettrie in his book L'homme machine from 1749 and 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 so we we've we've looked outwards in terms of quantity instead and and allowed ourselves to be imbalanced um away from from quality um the, the way that Ian McGilchrist would put this he would say that the the left hemisphere has over dominated our thinking um at the expense of the creative and intuitive right hemisphere um and this process is very apparent um in our culture so this has led within science and philosophy to um scientific materialism uh, and this is what we are trying to 
question in the rigorous academic report that we commissioned for what we call the Galileo Commission um, by Professor Harold Wallach um, on the limitations of uh, that exclusively materialistic view. Now, the, the associated um, part of the materialistic worldview is consumerism. Um, but also consumerism implies um, an extractive mentality towards the earth, an ex exploitation of people, an exploitation of the earth um, for human purposes. Um, and, and this gives rise to ecological devastation and ecological destruction. And, and this is what we're seeing around us. And so, so that the, the, there's a narrowness philosophically and scientifically um, in the materialistic worldview, um, but that the damage um, comes, um, the physical damage, as it were, comes from the, um, the economic equivalent um, involving all this, ex this exploitation um, and mining um, of everything. And I think this is a particularly um, masculine um, tra trait. I mean, just to give you a concrete, well, not actually concrete is not the right word, but example, um, we were going through the forest on a walk about two weeks ago. And uh, for most of the time, um, we were on narrow forest tracks with birds and flowers on either side. And then at a certain point, we came out in, into an area of forest that, that had been exploited. Uh, and suddenly we were on a wide road um, with no grass, big tractor um, uh, tracks, um, and strips of wood simply destroyed um, on either side. And it was very striking because there you had nature in, in her fullness and, and beauty and softness. And suddenly there was a, a sense of being brutalized um, in, in one's consciousness just by stepping into this area which had clearly just been unthinkingly or violently uh, altered by man. And that, so that, with, that, that's still with me um, as, a, as an experience. And it's a kind of metaphor, if you like. It doesn't mean to say that we shouldn't be doing anything mm. along these lines, but uh, the becoming more conscious of, of its implications and uh, maybe restoring places after you've gone through an extractive process, for instance. I mean, I think we, what we need is not just sustainability, um, but regeneration. Yeah. And that, that's, I, I, I'd like to see regenerative policy <laughs> brought in, because as soon as you bring those in, then nature, nature helps. You're helping nature and nature helps you. Mm. And talking about discipline at the spiritual level, you know, discipline has to be practiced at the social consumeristic level as well. Otherwise, growth just becomes... Um, ultimately absurd and self-destructive and, and, and the opposite of growth. It becomes, it becomes, uh, um, it undermines uh, the, the, the regeneration of, of, or the renaissance of, of, of the process of life we're, we're going through. So we need a discipline to say, we will grow so much this year and not anymore. And we will grow economically, financially, or educationally, or in whatever other way, we, we institutional way we're thinking, up to a certain point, because that will be where we can measure, maybe measure uh, the happiness that this will create. But if, if we go for unlimited growth, which is what the economists, I suppose, are thinking about now, we are, we are heading into a, a, really a realm of, of illusion, of absurdity, which means a different way of thinking. And I, I heard you talk about thinking beyond the brain. Just, maybe it's just a question of, of the word thought, but it mm -hmm. does seem to me that the way we use this word thought uh, makes a big difference to the way we understand the different elements of the spiritual and mental, emotional pro, pro, uh, progress process. Um, in the Desert Fathers, for example, they, they, the word logismoi uh, was, is translated as thoughts, but it, it's not just bad thoughts. I mean, logismoi are the forces and the patterns of consciousness. It's not just an idea 
or an image or a fantasy or a daydream. It's, it's, uh, so I just wondered if you had something to say about this word thought. How is a thought about beyond thought. the brain? What? A thought about thought. Thought about thought. Well, yeah. But how is thought beyond the brain different from thought as we normally think of thought? So you're, you're talking about a, a, a level of consciousness and awareness which maybe has an instrumental aspect to it too. You will act from this level of awareness, but it's, it's different. It's maybe it's similar to when you find yourself in an intractable situation, a conflict, for example, I was experiencing this quite recently in our organization. You find yourself in a conflict situation and there doesn't seem to be a way out. And then it comes because we listen to each other and we take a step back and, uh, and you make sure there are enough women in the room to counteract the, the male egos. And, um, and then it's clear. And we're no longer sort of thinking this idea, that idea, analyzing different things uh, to absurdity, but there's a clarity uh, and an in integral sense of the whole of, of, of the, and hope and and decency and, and trust all return all these good qualities come so there's two types of thinking and I, I, that's what i wanted to ask you is thinking beyond the brain how different is it from our ordinary brain thinking well i'm just going to back up slightly before i <clears throat> answer your question uh, just to um, this phrase beyond the brain um, because we we organize annual our annual conf consciousness conference is entitled beyond the brain and happens in november and it's a kind of complement to the mystics and scientists conference which you've spoken at um, on a couple of occasions and, and the, the phrase originally comes from um, stan groff um, and he's um, with his book called beyond the brain so we used it um, as the theme of our uh, consciousness conference starting with the Institute of Noetic Sciences in 2001. I can hear my dog barking um, downstairs. It's a is, different he, voice. Is, is he thinking or just barking? No, she's just uh, looking at people walking past. And it's probably a dog actually. Um, and then so that my, my book, uh, which was uh, a compilation of some of the early lectures is called Thinking Beyond the Brain. So it may well be that that's where, where you got the phrase from. And, and where my, my take on this um, is that we have, we have deified reason. And, and, and in the traditional sense, there was a, a faculty that we had beyond reason. And, and reason is, is ratio in Latin and dianoia in Greek, uh, which was the noetic faculty, the, the noesis, the gnosis, and the intellectus and, in Latin. And, and the, 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 the intellectus, for me, is this capacity to, to apprehend oneness, um, which goes beyond analytical thought. Um, and a, a, analysis itself means to loosen. Um, so that dianoia in Greek was, was this loosening analytical process rather than the process of, of synthesis or theoria, um, which is contemplation, um, which goes beyond um, observation. Uh, so, so, uh, so I think it's it, the, the thinking that is beyond the brain, as it were, in the sense that I'm talking about it now, um, is this apprehension that is beyond analysis, an intuitive um, apprehension which is beyond analysis. And Radhakrishnan said that um, intuition gives us an idea of the whole and intellect, he used, misused the term in my view, reason, I would say, uh, gives us an analysis of the parts. In fact, we need both, they're complementary. Mm. And Ian McGilchrist makes this point very, very clearly in, in talking about how the left and right hemispheres need to work together in order to have an adequate understanding of things. It's also where habit and discipline are, are crucial because there, you, you may be reading, you may be arguing, you may be thinking about the future, and then the bell goes, or the dog barks, 
and you know now is the time to meditate. So you sit down and you, you let go of all of that ratiocination and you meditate. And then you get up from the meditation cushion after a prescribed amount of time and you go back to whatever it is you were doing before. I mean, it, and it's, that's discipline, isn't it? If recognizing the, the valid uh, requirements of each, of each of our dimensions. If, if what, you're, what you're saying then is, is not a, certainly, I know, a, a rejection of science, but of scientism, the idea that science can provide us with all the answers and, and, and verifies all the questions. But would you say then that essentially science is a contemplative activity? If you go to the heart of the scientific inquiry, it's essentially contemplative. Well, I think scientific discovery um, is, is contemplative and intuitive because you, you can't get ideas just through analysis. And there are very many um, historical examples, and Einstein being one. But what, what, what that, this question put me in mind of um, was this distinction between contemplation and observation. Mm. And this is something which is taken up by Goethe. And, and in the mainstream, it's the Goethean science, so-called, is not at all well known. Um, and what Goethe was trying to do was to really enter deeply into the process of, let's say, the plant and, and understand how, how it grew and emerged um, and unfolded. You know, from it, so the seed, if you like, is an enfolded form and then the, the plant and the fruit um, unfold from that. So he was interested in this dynamic process and experiencing it, experiencing this process for himself. And he said that, that this required the, the creation of a new organ of perception. Um, so that, so if, we, if you look at a vase or a flower, um, then that's a contemplative activity. Um, but if you observe it, um, then the very notion of observation is what Henrik Skolimowski used to call a yoga of objectivity. Mm. In other words, you separate yourself from it and, and you're looking at, at its components rather than absorbing yourself in its gestalt um, as a whole. And so I think, that, I think that science, properly speaking, requires both contemplation and observation. And just another couple of examples. Um, one is, um, is Victor Schauberger, um, who was known as the water wizard. Um, and he was a forester originally. And if you read about his apprehension of water, um, he became water in his perception in order to understand it. In the same way, Barbara McClintock, um, when she was doing her microscopic work on maize, um, she imagined that she was what she was looking at. She was those microscopic processes. What was she, and so she identified with it. So there's a knowledge by identity that you can get through contemplation which is your insight. And then as a result, you can then create a theory which explains it, but that, that's secondary. And so contemplation in that sense, and since I'm using it as primary, and observation is secondary. And, and the scientific process as a whole <clears throat> is incomplete without both those elements. Hmm. So that is what um, the, theologically they call the co-natural knowledge, <laughs> you know it, because you can only know something actually because you are it or, or it knows you or, or there is a shared nature involved. Otherwise, you, you just wouldn't see it. I think it's like when they say some of these Amazonian tribes um, who, who had seen aeroplanes flying over, but because they had no sense of what they were, it didn't register. So instead of thinking that they were, you know, supernatural beings, they just blanked it out. They, they, they couldn't... It's like Captain Cook's ship, apparently. It was so large. Oh, that's right, yes. Yeah, the, 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 the natives couldn't, couldn't see it. Yes. <laughs> or, or apprehend it, maybe. The apprehend yeah, it is apprehend, a better, yeah. better word. And the word, the, the, 
what you were just what you were describing as scientific contemplative scientific uh, inquiry as, as opposed just to analytical observation is rather like Keats's idea of negative capability, isn't it? Mm, that, I think so. You, you, yes, Ian you, writes about that as well. You observe, but you then you become one with. And then you, then you get a different level um, of of understanding. As, as I say, it's knowledge by identity rather than knowledge by separation. And Keats says it's you when you when you've got there when you're observing a sparrow, or you then see it uh, in, without any irritable reaching after fact or reason. You know, ah, ir irritable is a great word. You know. Yes, that's very nice. I like that. I I hadn't I hadn't I wasn't familiar with that passage. So. Um, so, David, one last question arising out of this. There are many, many other directions we could take, obviously, but I think uh, most of the people who are, who are listening to you now will be meditators and will have experience for themselves how meditation has changed them, changed their lives, doesn't solve all their problems, but it does give us a very different way of approaching our life and its challenges. And, um, so we take it for granted that contemplative consciousness makes a difference to the people who are developing it, practicing it. Um, there's also, there are also claims that the, a, a critical mass of people who are doing this in society, maybe this is coming back to your idea of the creative minority who, could, who can take us through this jungle. Um, that this, this significant minority can create a, a tipping point in the institution or in the society in which they are meditating. And I've heard this from teachers at schools where children have, have been introduced to meditation. And it's not, it, they can certainly see a difference in the children and in the way the children behave to each other less bullying and so on. Uh, teachers will often say, the kids are really nicer to each other. Mm. Yes. They meditated. And the, if you speak to the, to the principal of the school, the head, headmaster or headmistress, they'll say, you know, the atmosphere in the school has really changed. And then, of course, other people will say, if you have a certain percentage of people who are meditating, then crime rates will automatically mm, go down. The Maharishi effect, yes. yes how do you do you do you think that is projection or wish fulfillment or is it is it is it describing a, a, a real fruit of the practice well i think you said you've explained it well yourself in terms of the example you gave with the school um, <clears throat> that that there's an incremental or tangible change in the atmosphere of the school and in the relationships um, as a result of in the practice of meditation and, and I, I think, I, I remember just one, um, another anecdote, um, which is relevant to this. We, we had Father Bede uh, talking at Mystics and Scientists in 1992 on the nature of light. And he gave two lectures. And on the questions on Sunday morning, um, I was in the overflow hall um, because we had so many people coming that we needed to hire an overflow hall. And, and um, somebody asked, well, how do you think we can best change the world? Mm. And Father B hesitated for a moment. Then he said, meditation. <laughs> and so that was very, and, and he then explained a bit more you know, along the lines that we're, we're talking here. And, but I, so I, I think it's like a leaven. Um, it's, a, it's a leavening um, which reaches or can reach disproportionately beyond um, the numbers of people involved. And I think what also changes is people's presence. Because um, you can, if you come into somebody's presence who um, has had a deep spiritual life and experience, then you, you can feel that. You, know, you can sense it. You, know, you pick it up vibrationally. And so, so I think, it, I think that's, a, that's another way of 
um, a ripple of change, if you like. So I think as well, it's like it's that there, there, there may be small drops, um, but each drop counts, mm. you know, towards the the effect on the whole. And what I'm also encouraged by um, is the the thinking of of David Hawkins. I don't know whether you know his his work on power versus force. Mm. And force is the is violence, which always creates a reaction against itself, whereas power is inner, and and um, those who have developed themselves very highly um, have a much higher frequency and reach um, than those who haven't focused on themselves at all, uh, and so that brings one back to the kind of creative minority idea that it's it's not necessary for for a huge number of people to be engaged in this activity to 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 move towards a a tipping point um, of some kind um, and so i think it's 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 a process um, and and for me what's important is is to keep a good compass direction and, and in that respect i use the the five principles of peter dunoff which are love wisdom truth justice and goodness or virtue and uh, if if we can move in those directions, and the the meditation practice, the contemplation, this all contributes towards it, um, then we may not see the kingdom of heaven in our lifetimes, um, but at least we are um, part of the uh, the quest and the striving towards it. Thank you, thank you so much. Yes, there's China, my famous favorite Chinese saying is, if you keep going in the direction in which you are heading, you will get to the place you're going to. <laughs> yes, indeed. <laughs> it suggests that it's time to change direction. And I think you've given us a wonderful sense of direction and uh, from many different points of the compass. And um, so my question to you at the beginning was, you know, what is your unifying uh, principle or interest, I think, has become very, very clear uh, in this time that we spent talking. So thank you for, for giving so much um, insight and, and so much uh, of what you have learned.